In this video, I'll be showing you how to program the Z80 using Retro Virtual Machine. But wait, this is WinApe. That's right, when I was searching for an Amstrad CPC emulator, the most popular is WinApe. This is all great if you have a Windows machine, but I don't. So I had to search for an alternative. And that's where I found Retro Virtual Machine. And as you can see, Retro Virtual Machine can emulate on Mac, Linux, and Windows. And it's uh, got a lot of features to it. The scroll down, multi-platform, multi-system, so you can have a ZX Spectrum and Amstrad together. There are all the versions, all the machines that you can run. But what I was really interested in is the development, how we can program the Z80. So if I scroll down the bottom here, what got me really interested, keep going down, what got me really interested is the debugger. So you can debug Z80 code, which looks really great, and also the assembler. We can also assemble. Now let's go ahead and download Retro Virtual Machine and install it and see what we can do with it. I've downloaded Retro Virtual Machine and here is the landing screen. As you can see, I have got some already installed virtual emulators. But to create a new one, we go to the menu on the top left hand corner, click on it, create a machine, and you can choose between ZX Spectrum or Amstrad. I like an Amstrad. Next. And you can choose between 464, 664, or 6128. Let's go all the way and uh, get the 6128. Different versions of the keyboard layout, English for me, and create. And there's the new machine. So we click on it. And here we have the virtual machine. It's currently off at the moment. And we click on the top menu bar here, the menu drops down. So let's turn it on. Hit the on button, and there we have it. We have our Amstrad CPC 6128 machine. There's a few options up the top here, which I won't go into details, but you can just look at them and click on them. So we've got all the video settings. Let's just set this to the best quality, HDMI. And we've got sound settings. We also can add on more components, so we can add on memory expansions, cartridges, mouse. To activate debug mode or development mode, you go to the menu on the left and then click on development mode. That will bring you a hammer up the top here. Clicking on this hammer will give you an extra debugging development menu. You can look at the CPU and you can view the registers, the shadow registers, the 16-bit registers, the stack, the program counter and all well, the code that's running at the moment and also the flags. You also have the CPC which displays the CRTC, the registers in the CRT controller and also the gate array. You can also look at memory, gives you a hex dump of the memory at any location that you choose. You can also view the disassembled version of the memory and also breakpoints. And lastly we have our debugging terminal. This is where we can debug the code we can look at directories, we can modify files, and we'll have a look at that now. Retro Virtual Machine version 2.0. Thank you Juan Carlos Gonzalez Amestoy for creating this uh, wonderful tool. So how do we use this terminal? Well, we'll type help. That's what it says. And it gives you a whole raft of commands or command line options that you can choose from. Assemble, break, change directory. They kind of split up into three categories. Coding commands like assemble, step, 
There's also directory and file manipulation commands like change directory or save or load. And there's various commands to show the state of the computer, like looking at the memory, ROM information. One of the useful things that you can do in the debug terminal is to evaluate expressions. There's an example down the bottom there. You can type in equals, hash, maybe F4, press return, and it will give you the decimal value, 244, the hex value, and the binary version. You can also add numbers together, so the plus, You can also do various anding or oring or XORing via the debug terminal. So, for instance, 55 and it with AA, get zero, up arrow, gives you the option again. You can OR it, gives you FF. And if you do this, you can XOR the two bytes together. If you want to know how a command works, you type help and then the command ls, for instance, list, and it will give you the information about how to use the ls command with all the options. Really useful here. With ls, by default, it looks at the current system, so if I type in ls, it will look at the current directory. So let's change directory to where all my code will be. Documents. Autocomplete works with pressing tab. Retro virtual machine. Do an ls. What we can do now is we can copy these files to an actual disk, uh, Amstrad disk. If I just hide that window for now and click on the disk image, top right hand corner, we can then load a disk, insert, you can also create a disk. I've already created one. You type cat and it's an empty disk. What we can do now is use the copy command, so copy, so we can say, let's say print ASCII char to A and at, and it will copy it to the disk. So if I do an ls here, oh sorry, a cat, my emulator, you can see now there is a file there, print ASZ81K. Uh, it's not going to do much at the moment because uh, it doesn't understand what the Z80 code is. And if I do an ls on a at, it will give me a listing. You can also remove it. So rm a at and then p, p tab. Yes, you want to remove it. Click back on, on the emulator, do a cat, and it's gone. And remember, for all other commands, you can just do a help and the command itself, and it will give you all the options relating to that command. Now, let's do some coding. Here is a little program that I've created that all it does is print all the printable ASCII characters to the screen. So first, I'll start at position 40,000 in memory, just a nice location to start at on the Amstrad. Now the Amstrad has firmware calls that the basic interpreter uses to do its stuff like print things to the screen, get keyboard information, set the mode, and there's about 50 of these firmware calls and I'm going to use two of them here. The first one is set mode, which is at BCOE. It looks at the A register and it sets the mode depending on what the A register is set at. And also I'm going to use print, which just prints whatever A is in ASCII to the screen. The number of printable characters that you can usually display in ASCII is uh, from 32, which is space, to 255. 
So 255 minus 32 is 223, and we'll start at space character 32. It's a real easy program here. First, I just set the mode to 1, so load A to 1 and call set mode. I load the count to B, which is 223, and the first position at C. Then I load A, then I load C to A. I print it out to the screen. Now when you do a print command, it actually increments the cursor by one and also starts at default zero, zero position or column one, row one, top left hand corner. I move to the next character and just loop again until all the characters are printed. So let's load this into the retro, retro virtual machine. So let's have a look where it is again. LS print ASCII char. So all we need to do is do assemble, do help again. Let's type it out properly. Go up ASM, assemble files. So ASM, and then I say print ASCII char, press return. And there it is, it assembles and deploys it and loads it into memory. So I can bring up the disassembler screen. And if I go to location 40,000, you can see the code. There it is, load A1, call the set mode, B and C as the counters, load AC, print it out, and then increment the counter and decrease the, sorry, in increment the next ASCII character, C, and then decrease the counter. And lastly, let's run this code. So to run the code, the Amstrad requires you to call the bit of memory that it's located in. So I'll say call and 40,000. And that's it. There's all our ASCII characters printed out to the screen. We can also debug this code. It's easy to debug the code. All you got to do is in the dis disassembler view, click on the line that you want to stop the, the program at. A little dot comes up. If we run the code again, 40,000, you can see it's hanging and it's saying debug mode. So let's load the CPU up. There it is, I'll just hide the terminal screen. And you can see it's actually paused at the moment and it's stopped on the line, my breakpoint line. The top menu here has play, step into, step over, and step try states, which I'm not sure what, what it does do. I don't use it. So we can step over one command. So now you can see in red, has, the A has changed to 20, which is the first ASCII character, space. We're going to print it out, so we'll step over. Increment C. So C now goes to 21. And we decrease B. So it goes to DE. And then it will jump back again. Now it hasn't printed out to the screen. There is a delay there. We need to, uh, there's a, like a refresh issue with the, you won't get the information immediately. But if I just keep pressing play and going through the next characters, it will eventually start updating the screen, as you can see. So to remove the breakpoint, we can either click on the red uh, spot where we set the breakpoint, or we can go to our terminal, load that up again. We can type in break. It will list all the breakpoints, and then we can say break minus x removes the breakpoints. We can also add breakpoints by just saying break and add it again, 9C49. And there's a quick demonstration of how, how we can use a retro virtual machine to load and execute Z80 code. When programming for the Amstrad, you usually would like to see the results on the screen. Printing information on the screen is somewhat not straightforward if you want to display something fast. The firmware calls are slow, very slow, and the screen memory map isn't sequential. 
But once you understand how the screen works, it really isn't that difficult to display information to the screen. Now the screen is separated into eight blocks. Each block is two Ks worth, but a block doesn't go down sequentially per row. The top left corner of the screen starts by default C000, and it goes across 80 bytes, the top of the screen to C04F, and you would think that it will go to the next row down. Well, it doesn't. It actually goes eight rows down to C050. And then the last row, C780, goes to C7CF. And then the next row starts, block number one starts at C800. That's 800 bytes down. So one row down on the screen is 800 bytes. Eight rows down is 50 bytes. It is a bit confusing. And then the last row, or the last block, starts at F800 and goes to FFFF. Now a keen observer would notice that there are some missing bytes here at the end of the screen. So like C7D0 to C7FF aren't used at all. So once you understand how the screen is structured, so you've got 80 bytes across, and if you want to go one row down, you need to move 800 bytes down. But if you want to go to the next row of characters, 8 by 8 characters down, you need to just go down by 50 bytes. It actually isn't that difficult to program. You can also see that the screen loads 8 pixels down when a file is loaded directly to the screen. If I do a cat, I have a screen file here, just an image. And if I load that to the screen, load screen.cr, and I load it directly into the screen memory, which is C000. You can see the uh, when it loads up, the lines will go sequentially across. And you can see that sort of scroll effect downwards as it fills out. The abstract has three modes, or graphical modes, mode 0, 1, and 2. Each mode has a different number of columns, but they all have the same number of rows. So mode 0, 20 columns only, so you've got thick characters. Mode 1 is the default mode, and mode 2 is like a narrow mode, 80 characters across, 25 rows down. Now in particular, the pixels per byte are, are different. So the less pixels per byte, the more options you have for colours, and the more pixels per byte, the less colours you, you can choose. So mode 0 has 2 pixels per byte, 4 and 8 for mode 2. So the total pixels on the screen for mode 0 is 160 by 200, 320 by 200 for mode 1, and mode 2 640 by 200. And in particular, the colours that you can use changes. So the lower number of pixels, the more colours that you can have. So we'll be looking at mode 1 today. Let's have a look at mode 1 pixel colouring in detail. There are 80 bytes across the screen, and each byte in mode 1 contains 4 pixels. So how do we get the 4 pixels from 8 bits? An easier way to look at it is by putting the bits next to each other or on top of each other. You have the low nibble and the high nibble. So the combination of bits 3 and bit 7 will set that particular ink colour. Now 0 and 0 together combine ink colour 0 and by default it's blue. Bits 2 and bits 6 represent the next pixel and if the combination is 0 and 1 it's in colour 1, which is by default bright yellow. Bits 1 and 5, the combination of those two bits, if it's 1 and 0, it's ink number 2, and by default it's bright cyan. And bit 0 and bit 4, the combination of those two, if they're both set to 1, the ink colour is 3, and the default ink colour is bright red. So a combination of those bits together and the different bits that are set will give you the different colours per pixel, and there's four pixels. So let's have a look at another example of an 8x8 picture. Here is some data that I've uh, by default put at the top left hand corner of the screen, starting at C000, and you can see the next row down is 800 bytes down, C800, and 
I'm using an 8 by 8 graphic here, so it's two pixels across because it's 80 bytes per row and four bytes, sorry, four pixels per byte. If these bytes are put onto the screen, what would you see? You'll see this. So let's have a look at the bottom, uh, second bottom row, left hand, to just show that how these colors are worked out. Well, you can see pixels, uh, bits seven and three together combined a zero, zero, so you get in color zero, which is by default blue. A yellow is a one and a zero, and also one and zero, another yellow, and lastly zero, one gives you cyan. And what about red? Well, one and one give you red. Once you understand how the uh, pixels work and the combinations of bits, you can make uh, all sorts of different pictures. Now these inks are, are just default ink colors. You can also change the inks to any number of different colors that the Amstrad provides. Let's now use this theory on the screen layout to create a, a program that will print characters really quickly to the screen. I've created a small example here to demonstrate the weird structure of the screen layout. All I'm going to do here is print a character out to the screen and just sequentially go through from C000, which is the top left hand corner of the default screen on the Amstrad, to FFFF. And you can see that it will gradually go down eight rows at a time and eventually fill the screen. So quickly, I'll just walk you through this little code, this program that I've created. I've just got some firmware calls, key wait, screen and set mode. So a key wait will just wait for a key to be pressed. Screen is just uh, my default top of the screen. It's actually not a firmware call. And set mode is, is the call to just set, reset the screen to mode one. I'm also going to look for character turn here to exit the program or to go to the next line down. So we start, we just set the mode to one. We have the screen memory size of 16 Ks. The start of the screen is C000. And we've got a 2K counter here. This just helps me uh, pause the program you know, when, when 2K is counted. So I'm going to display this to the screen. So I've got it in the pixel or the byte format here. So this will actually give you all the four different colors. So we've got zero and zero, one and zero, zero and one, and one and one, the end here. I'm gonna load that value into the screen. So just directly into the screen, load HLA. I'm just gonna call a little delay so we can really see it, it doesn't happen too fast. And then all I'm doing is incrementing to the next screen location, just one up. I'm decrementing the 2K counter so I can just pause after 2Ks. And if uh, I've hit 2Ks, then I'm gonna wait for a keyboard pressed. Otherwise, I'm, what I'm gonna do is just decrement the main counter, which is the screen memory size by one. So this is just a 16 bit decrement um, call here and I'll wait for a key pressed uh, once, once it's all finished to just repeat the program again. And I've got, just got a small delay function here. Again, it's just de decrementing uh, BC until it goes to zero. So let's load this program up and give it a run. All right, so let's load the program up. So ASM, we assemble it. The program's called so the look, screen fill sequential, load it up. As you can see, the disassembler view has now loaded the code. You can see it on the right hand side here. And uh, let's give it a run. So call thousand. I'll just hide the terminal see what's going on and run it and as you can see it's printing out sort of some dotted characters there let's zoom into that to have a look what's going on because it should print one of each color the four different colors and there's a zoom version of the 
monitor or the screen, and you can see it's got blue, yellow, cyan, red. Blue, yellow, cyan, red. And there should be uh, 80 uh, or 40 pixels across, 25 down. Let's now increment to the next line and the next line and we'll keep filling the screen out. And as you can see, it sequentially fills down eight pixels downwards and two Ks across. So there are all the blocks being loaded. And we've got our last one. Now that I've got a better understanding of how this screen works on the Amstrad, let's see if we can fill it out as quick as possible without using you know, firmware calls. This little example here that I've created actually compares the firmware calls, the slower version, to, you know, from what I can gather, the fastest way you can update the screen with. So again, I've just got some basic firmware calls just to set up the screen. I'm also using clear here to clear the screen and also print to print the character out. And that's for the firmware example. The cell that I'm going to print out in ASCII is E9. This program's in two parts. It has the slow example, the print slow, and the print fast example. So the first part of the code, I'm just going to clear the screen out. I'm going to call the print slow method. That will just print or fill the screen out with characters using the, the firmware calls, wait for carriage return, and if carriage return is pressed, then it will go to start two, or if any, if any other key is pressed, it will just repeat the process again. And the same code is used just to call the print fast routine. So let's have a look at the print slow. This is the easier one. We've seen something similar before. We have a thousand characters to print. So that was the mode one, which is 40 times 25, 40 characters across, 25 down gives you a thousand and the ASCII character that I'm going to print is cell which is E9. So I call the print command, the firmware print command and I do that a thousand times so I just reduce BC until it's zero. Once it ends I just return back. Every time the print command is called it moves to the next character across just like when you were typing out on the screen. So the more complicated one is the display, the fast display, which just display, which draws the pixel out directly to the screen. And now I understand how the how the screen works from C000, one row down is 800 bytes, eight rows down is five by, 50 bytes. I can then manipulate the screen and print characters quite fast. Now this code might look a bit overwhelming and confusing, but it's really not. Again, I just clear the screen out. Now I have a nested loop here of rows and columns, so 25 rows down, 40 columns across. I load the 8x8 pixel data sprite to DE. I call a method called plot, which will plot that sprite to the screen and BC here is two bytes across and eight bytes down. And then what I do is I restore the initial starting location of the character of the of the eight by eight, and I increment it HL twice because we're looking at two bytes across to go to the next row. Oh, sorry, the next column. And then I just repeat that character printing out again. So it prints 80 columns across. Then when I get down to the end of the line, I don't want to go down by 800, I don't want to just go down by 50. So I increment HL, which is the start of the screen address, by 50 down. And then I just loop again the number of, of rows, 25 rows. So let's have a look at this plot method, or this plot call. Now if you can remember, we'll have a look at the data that I'm displaying here. You can remember that example I showed. We've got two bytes across and we're encoding pixel color data within those, within those two bytes. Remember, four 
pixels per byte and depending on which bits are set which color I'm going to get and that will this example here will display you know a square of yellow colors so again plot all I'm doing is getting the sprite data now the sprite data is down here which is there sprite at the bottom of the screen I'm storing the first byte in HL I'm then incrementing HL by one, one across, and displaying the next byte. So I'm repeating that again. Once I do the two bytes, I'm going to actually decrease the current HL, or increase it, I should say, or go downwards 800 bytes down to get to the next row. So I have got code in here just in case we go past FFFF. We need to then reset it back to the top of the screen, which is C000 plus the offset of 50, depending on where we are currently on the screen. Now in this case here, I'm not gonna go off, but I've just got this bit of code in here, just in case. And if there's no correction to be done, I just decrement C, which is eight, and do the next line down. And that's it. So let's give this a run. Let's now assemble that program, so ASM, and it's called screen fill example. It compiles, it loads into memory. You can see the in the disassembler window that it's updated. I'll just minimize the terminal and let's run it. Call 4000. So this is the slow example. I'll just repeat that again. It sequentially goes down. You're calling the firmware calls. This is like you would do in a basic program. If you just say print a character out, it will just print it out to the screen. And in my timings there, it probably takes a few seconds to actually fill the screen out with that character. So let's use the fast example. And you can see this fast example takes less than a second to print the whole screen out quite quickly. This example here is that I'm plotting each pixel to the screen. Now I understand how the screen works. I can now manipulate the screen quite fast. So this little method here will be used in a future video, in the next video, in fact. And I'll demonstrate um, how to create a game using uh, the fast screen method. So there's my video. I hope that you found it useful in terms of programming for the Z80 using Retro Virtual Machine. It's quite a, an amazing product. RVM has a lot of features to it. I've only shown you the coding and the debugging features of the, of the application. So I encourage you to download it, have a look at it if you're interested in programming or Amstrad CPC computers. The terminal is quite powerful, the, t the debugger. There's lots of options I haven't shown you. Have a play with it. You can always use help and to find what the command does do. And happy coding.